Well, hello, everybody, and welcome back to your favorite show on the internet, Raw Law Unfiltered, with your favorite host on YouTube, The DUI Guy Plus, that is me. Today, we are going to be covering something very, very special. Today, we are going to read the filing in on PACER from the federal lawsuit that Jeremy Hales's attorneys filed yesterday evening. So this is fresh. This is as fresh as it gets, folks. It does not get much fresher than this. This is like the fish at the fish market. And you're like, so how old is that fish? And you can see that it's still flopping. It's still it's still alive. That's how fresh it is. Um, oh, my God. Oh, my God. You guys buckle up. This is going to be a doozy. This is going to be a doozy. Um, there is a 39 page, including all the exhibits, 39 page and affidavits, 39 page motion. There's actually two motions filed, but they're exactly the same. And I will show you guys that it is, they're literally word for word, exactly the same. And that's not uncommon when you have two defendants filing two same exact motions, which is exactly what happened in this case. Both John and Lynette filed a motion to dismiss, um, Oh, I just realized I forgot my cup. Oh, well, my girlfriend is still sleeping, so I can't even ask her. I'll just drink from the from the can. Like a savage, like a savage. Actually, hold on a second. I'll be right back. I just realized that I was not even talking uh, to, a, to a closed microphone. Anyway, um, muted boomer. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah. Anyway, <laughs> this morning is just like all over the place. All over the place. Okay. All right. Um, if you want this mug, BT dubs. If you want this mug, it's going to be included in the description below. I just realized I forgot to add it. And the reason for that is because <coughs> it has been a very, very, uh, it's early. It's early. It's been a very early morning. It's like 8.55. I literally woke up like an hour ago. Cut me some slack, yo. So if you want the mug, um, I'm including it in the description below right, <coughs> right now. No, I can't get a break, Tom. That's exactly right. I'm just trudging along. But um Let's have some fun. Let's let's learn some shit. How about that? Let's learn some stuff. Uh, so this was filed yesterday, as you can see uh, on the top right hand corner, uh, <clears throat> clearly visible. March 26, 2024, yesterday, late in the evening, United States District Court, Northern District of Florida, Gainesville Division. We're back in the same courtroom that we were in. Jeremy Hales. A plaintiff versus Lynette Michelle Lacey Alexis Preston. I love how he included like all her five names and John Cook. I love how she has like five names and he barely has two to scramble by. Now, this is the memorandum in opposition to defendant Preston's motion to dismiss. As I will cover in just a few moments, you will see that uh, both John and uh, Lynette's motion to dismiss. Uh, opposition motion to dismiss is exactly the same because their motions to dismiss were exactly the same. So this is not uncommon at all. I just wanted to make sure there was nothing on my on my screen there. So sorry about that. But anyway, uh, hello, everybody, and good morning. Let's do this. This is going to be, oh, God, I can't wait. Okay, so let's start with the easy stuff. Let's start with the easy stuff. This is a memorandum in opposition to defendant Preston. And again, it will be the same for Cook. They filed motions to dismiss a few days ago, if you all remember. Motions to dismiss Jeremy's lawsuit. They're like, no, Jeremy, no lawsuit for you. You sue us. No, 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 no. We sue you, you know. And now this is Jeremy responding to their motions to dismiss. So they're saying, uh-uh, no, no, no. 
Judge, you should not dismiss this lawsuit. And here's why. Now, there are about eight attachments to this. Uh, I will cover them, but I'll cover them off screen because I have not had chance to redact them and I don't want to show them on screen because most of them have very sensitive personal information such as addresses um, and uh, personal identifying information for Jeremy. And I do not want to dox Jeremy. So I will still cover them, but I'll cover them off screen since, like I said, we haven't had a chance to redact them. But the meat, the meat of the argument is going to be right here. So let's dive in. Let's sink our teeth into it. Plaintiff Jeremy Hales, uh, Mr. Hales, by and through undersigned counsel and pursuant to Federal Rule of Civil Procedure 12B1 and 28 U.S.C. 1332, files this memorandum in opposition pursuant to Local Rule 7.1e to defendant Preston's motion to dismiss this complaint for lack of diversity, jurisdiction, and amount in controversy herein, hereafter the motion, and states as follows. So first we start with the table of contents. We have a, a table of authorities. There's complete diversity, and here's why. And the amount of controversy is satisfied. We're going to have some cases. This is all standard stuff, some statutes, and what pages to find them on. Here we go. There is complete diversity among the parties. So remember, their first argument was lack of diversity. And we're not talking about race. I know when you hear the word diversity, the first thing that comes to mind is like, well, what country are they from? Uh, are they African-American or are they... Hispanic, or are they Asian, or are they Caucasian? That's not what we're talking about here. When it comes to diversity in terms of the federal, uh, in, in a federal lawsuit, you're looking for diversity amongst states. So let's say if both residents are from Florida and you're suing each other over $10, a $10 bill, you will never land in federal court. Federal courts don't want to listen to these cases. You're both from the same state. You're both residents of the same state. The amount of controversy is $10. You do not meet the minimum threshold requirement of $75,000 uh, to be in, in federal court. Now, if it was the amount in controversy was $75,000 or more, it used to be $50,000 just a few years ago, but they changed their say few. It's I think it's been like 20 now, maybe 15 or 20 years. Chad can probably look this up. When was the amount in controversy? $50,000 for federal courts. It is now seventy-five. dollars Who knows? Maybe soon they'll raise it to $100,000. Um, it's all the same to the courts. But... Uh, to you, it may mean a difference. You know, if you have a $76,000 lawsuit, you may be able to land in federal court, even if you're both residents of the same state. So in order to land in federal court, you need at least, if, if, if let's say Jeremy is from Ohio and Lynette is from Florida, ding, 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 like this case, you have diversity. You don't even need an amount in controversy of being 75000 or more. Why? Because where do you file the lawsuit? Do you file it in Ohio? Do you file it in Florida? It is inconvenient for the parties, so they file in federal court so that federal courts get to sort this stuff out. So state courts don't play favorites. Okay? So that's how it works. Now, Mr. Hales is a resident of Ohio. See the affidavit, which we will cover, um, of Jeremy B. Hales here and after Hales affidavit. Inasmuch as both defendants are residents of Florida, there is complete diversity jurisdiction. As discussed more below, defendant's motion lacks merits and should be denied. Federal jurisdiction based on diversity of citizenship requires that the matter and controversy be between citizens of different states. That's obvious. That's the 28 U.S.C. 1332-A1. For purposes of diversity jurisdiction, a natural person is, quote, a natural person is a citizen of the state in which he is domiciled. Now, remember, we talked about this term before, and I used it kind of loosely, and people were like, you know, I said, Jeremy is both a domiciliary of Ohio and Florida. You guys remember that language? Jeremy is both a domiciliary, and I said, it's just a fancy word for that's where he can claim residence. What does it mean to be a domiciliary? What does it mean to be domiciled? What does it mean to be um, to be a domicile of. All it means is, 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 by the way, the root is a Latin word. It means dom, doma. Doma, dom is actually also in, in Slavic languages, is home, is house, right? So to be a domiciliary means you can claim residence in multiple places. For instance, if you have properties, if you have a property in every one of the 50 <clears throat> of the United States, in theory, you could probably claim domiciliary status in all 50 states. Now, I'm sure at some point it starts to break down. 
you know, if you do claim domiciliary in like 10 or more states, but who knows? I, I've never had a situation like that. And uh, this is not the case here. We only have two states, Ohio and Florida. And clearly, clearly, Jeremy is a domiciliary of both. And Lynette and John both claiming that, well, he is seen around town is not enough to claim that he is a domiciliary of that state. In theory, Jeremy could have zero domiciliary status in Florida. No, that's not true because he has property there. He spends a lot of time there. He has business there. He does, you know, his, um, what's it called? Um, not excavation, a treasure hunting, treasure hunting in Florida. So he's clearly a domiciliary of Florida as well, but he's also a domiciliary of Ohio, as we will learn in a moment what that means and why. And why is it important for this case? Again, diversity, right? Diversity of citizenship. Noting that for purposes of diversity, citizenship is equivalent to domicile. Domicile requires both residence in states and <coughs> an intention to remain there indefinitely. So probably if you have a house in all 50 states, it's where you spend the most time that you're going to be a domiciliary, right? While residency is necessary, it alone by itself is insufficient to establish a citizenship in a state. Now that's very important. Very, very important. Residency is necessary, but by itself alone is not sufficient to establish a citizenship in a state, right? A person's domicile is the place of his true, fixed, and permanent home and principal establishment and to which he has the intention or her has the intention of returning whenever he is absent or she therefrom. Furthermore, a change of domicile requires a concurrent showing of physical presence at the new location with an intention to remain there indefinitely. Those are the two, it's a two-pronged test from uh, Maz v. Perry case. So from the Maz case, a change of domicile requires a concurrent showing that a physical presence at a new location and an intention to remain there indefinitely. So if let's say uh, Lynette is going to argue, well, he is seen around town. So, okay, she meets the first prong, physical presence at the new location, Levy County, Florida. But hold on a second. What about the second prong? An intention to remain there indefinitely. She's going to have to prove that Jeremy has the intent to live in Florida for the rest of his life. And that does not seem like the truth. Hi, baby. How you doing, girl? How did you sleep? Did you sleep okay? Hi, baby. Sorry, my cat is <laughs> um, saying hello. Say hi to chat, kitty. You want to come up? Come on. There we go. All right. So um, that's the second prong. That's the second prong. That is uh, um, she will never be able to meet. Why? Because Jeremy wants to remain in Ohio. That's his primary place of residence, as I imagine this motion is about to say. Now, this means that there is a presumption in favor of continuing domicile. Domicile once acquired is presumed to continue until it is shown to have been changed. Sanders stuff. We're just covering the law. In September, now we get to the facts. Here we go. In September 2023, Mr. Hales filed a lawsuit in the Ohio courts. Ah, now we have an intent to stay. Why would somebody who does no longer resides in a state where they're not domiciled, according to Lynette and John, why would you file a lawsuit in, in a state like Ohio? In September 2023, Mr. Hales filed a lawsuit in the Ohio courts against Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook. That is huge. That's the Hales affidavit at paragraphs 20 to 21, which we'll cover in a moment. In October 2023, the Ohio courts issued the uh, issued a final civil protection order, the little typo there, final civil protection orders in favor of Mr. Hales and against Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook. Hales affidavit, paragraph 21. This is going to cite the Hales affidavit throughout, so I'm just going to skip over that. Mr. Hales has been a domiciliary of the state of Ohio since his birth in 1977, has always had only an Ohio driver's license. Motor vehicles are registered in Ohio. He has his mailing address in Ohio, pays property taxes in Ohio, files his federal income taxes from Ohio, and intends to remain a permanent resident and domiciliary of Ohio. Now, this is very important because remember, uh, in their motion, John and Lynette have both individually and collectively claimed, well, he's seen around town and he's registered to vote. 
Okay, register to vote. That's one. All right. What about the other stuff? Oh, he has an Ohio license. He has been there since birth. His vehicles are registered in Ohio, so registration plates. His mailing address is in Ohio. He pays property taxes in Ohio, federal income taxes in Ohio, and intends to remain a permanent resident. So seven versus one. I don't know. Odds are not looking good, John and Lynette. Odds are not looking good. <sighs> Sorry to break the news. Mm. In Florida, homestead exemptions are for property owners who maintain permanent residence at the property in question. There's a statute on that in the Constitution. Mr. Hales does not have his homestead in Florida. In a case called Granite Equipment Leasing Corporation, no one can have more than a single homestead exemption then because no one can have more than a single domicile at the given time uh, any given debt arises. Thus, as shown above, plaintiff Jeremy Hales has demonstrated complete diversity among the parties. Now let's talk about the amount and controversy. This is another prong. You don't have to have both. You have to have at least one. But why not? If they're arguing both, let's fight back on both. You know what I'm saying? Um, defendant. This is, in this case, uh, it's uh, Lynette, but this is also going to be equally the same to John. So Lynette and John have made a bare bones allegation that the complaint has, quote, no allegation establishing the minimum amount of controversy for federal diversity jurisdiction. In doing so, <clears throat> both Lynette and John misstate and misrepresent the law to this court by citing to an opinion which does not exist. I'm sorry, what? In doing so, both John and Lynette misstated and misrepresented the law to the court by stating an opinion which does not exist? The motion states, oh my God. See, other than the conclusory statement, paragraph two, there's no factual basis for the court to conclude the jurisdictional amount is satisfied in this case. However, the document from that case from March 7th, 2019 contains no such statement. So they lied to the court? Holy shit, you guys were right. I thought that they were just, I thought that John and Lynette, I mean, I knew that they were kind of dumb. No offense, but come on. Don't, don't ever represent yourself in court. Other than the conclusory statement in paragraph two, there's no factual basis for the court to conclude the jurisdictional amount is satisfied in this case. That's from some case called Lee Memorial Health Systems versus Lexington Insurance Company, according to... John and Lynette's motions. However, it uh, looks like the uh, Jeremy's lawyers, Randy and Doreen, presumably, have obviously combed through and they, they found the cases and they read them and they were like, uh, this, this case doesn't say that. I'm not joking. You guys were right. Must have been Google Law, same as Mr. Cohen in the federal court did the same in the last filing. Um, hmm. MG Law says, I told you all, I checked the sites on stream. They cite the wrong order in the middle district. And maybe they did use Chat GPT. This guy's a bit corny. Uh, fuck yeah, I am. Welcome, welcome to the party, Southern Red Sox girl. I am I'm as corny as as corn can come. And that's not a euphemism for porn either. Although. Anyway. Um, welcome to the show. Welcome to the show, Red Red Sox girl. So this is interesting. This is very interesting. Um, I mean, I, I figured they're idiots, but now they're they're misleading the court. You do not mislead the court. Even if you have a shit case, doesn't matter if you have a good case, you have a shit case, you never mislead the court. doesn't matter if you're a pro se defendant or a pro se plaintiff or a, an attorney. You just don't do it because you're making yourself look bad. And right out of the gate, they are now citing case law. Okay. But they're saying this case, Your Honor, says this. 
and it doesn't, that is absolutely bonkers. That is stupid. You are an idiot. Hashtag corn star. Hell yeah. I am cornholio. I need tippy for my bunghole. Beavis and butthead, anyone? Uh, defendant's misrepresentation misrepres should not be well taken by this court. Facial attacks on the complaint require the court merely to look and see if the plaintiff has sufficiently alleged the basis of subject matter jurisdiction and the allegations in his complaint are taken as true for purposes of the motion. Um, by the way, real quick, I want to show you guys something. Uh, on Pacer, there was a notation for this case that uh, when, when the motions to dismiss, 12B1 motions to dismiss are filed, there is a requirement here. Um, well, that's okay. I don't, I don't have to like, uh, I don't have to show you guys, but uh, March 20th, it said action required magistrate judge. It's been assigned to judge Zachary Bolitho. You can just take my word for it. If you don't believe me, go check it out. And now, now there's another update action required this morning. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, because of the responses to the motion to dismiss have been uh, filed by Jeremy. There is a crucial distinction often overlooked between 12B1 motions that attack the complaint on its face and 12B1 motions that attack the existence of subject matter jurisdiction, in fact, quite apart from any pleadings. Because 12B6 results in a determination on the merits at an early stage of a plaintiff's case, the plaintiff is afforded the safeguard of having all its allegations taken as, tr as true and all inferences favorable to the plaintiff will be drawn. Now, where the plaintiff is in this case has alleged a sum certain that exceeds the requisite amount in controversy that amount controls if made in good faith. In order for a court to refuse jurisdiction, it must appear to a legal certainty, certainty that the claim is really for less than the jurisdictional amount. Now in diversity cases where the basis of jurisdiction is conferred by the other section, the sum demanded in good faith in the initial pleading shall be deemed to be the amount in controversy. The amount in controversy must exceed 75,000. There's an extra zero in there, exclusive of interest and costs. Now, good faith is me measured objectively. The question is whether to anyone familiar with the applicable law, this claim could objectively have been viewed as worth more than the jurisdictional amount. For example, the test of a plaintiff's good faith is not his subjective state of mind, but a very strict objective standard. Oops. Sorry, I pressed a button. Um, is whether anyone, good faith is measured objectively. The question is whether to anyone familiar with the applicable law, this claim could objectively have been viewed as worth. Okay, we got through that. If the sum claimed is made in good faith, the court limits its inquiry to determining whether it is a legal certainty that the claim is really for less than the jurisdictional amount. This burden may be met by amending pleadings or submitting affidavits. To determine the amount in controversy, the district court first looks to the face of the plaintiff's complaint. Also, whereas here, when multiple claims are brought by one plaintiff, and we have six, if you remember, against one defendant, the total amount of all claims can be aggregated to reach the $75,000 threshold. The plaintiff, Jeremy, in this case, has brought multiple claims against the defendants for defamation per se, civil remedies for criminal practices acts, which is RICO, uh, and tortious interference with advantageous business relationships, three per uh, defendant, three for John, three for Lynette, total of six. Defamation per se does not require any allegation or showing of damages. Plaintiff's defamation per se claims involve accusations of an infamous crime, which may be irreparably impugn his reputation. For instance, in Lawnwood Medical Center, confirming $5 million jury verdict on surgeon's slander per se claim against hospital. That's good enough. Um, another one, profession and award of damages in excess of 75000 is not legally impossible. In calculating the amount of controversy, the courts have considered, among other things, affidavit testimony, prayers for punitive damages, and requests for attorney's fees found in the complaint. Now, when a statute authorizes 
the recovery of attorney's fees, a reasonable amount of those fees is included in the amount of controversy. When attorney's fees are provided by contract or statute, they are properly included in determining amount in controversy. Here, Jeremy's complaint seeks attorney's fees under the Florida RICO statutes. See the complaint. Thus, attorney's fees are properly included in determining amount in controversy. Moreover, all of plaintiff's remaining claims seek unliquidated damages in tort, rendering any <coughs> endeavor and valuating those claims unfeasible, absent a consideration of evidence on damages. Many courts have cautioned against attempting to appraise such unliquidated tort claims for purposes of determining jurisdiction. To do so necessarily requires the court to prematurely judge the merits of the case. We are mindful in a continental casualty company case, we are mindful that when the issue of the jurisdictional amount is intertwined with the merits of the case, courts should be careful not to decide the merits under the guise of determining jurisdiction without the ordinary incidence of trial. In Deutsch versus Hughes, uh, if access to federal district courts is to be further limited, it should be done by statutes and not by court decisions that permit a district court judge to prejudge the monetary value of an unliquidated claim. Now, plaintiff Jeremy Hales has over 700,000 subscribers on his YouTube channel. This shows that the damages um, to that YouTube business should not be difficult to accept and tort. It would be wholly inappropriate at this juncture to assign a value to plaintiff's remaining claims where he has not yet had the opportunity to present his case. Oh, and by the way, there's a very easy solution. I don't know why it was not specifically taken by Jeremy <coughs> and his lawyers. It's just a strategical move. All you have to do is in the complaint name like a figure. You know, $10 million or whatever. Uh, I mean, that's probably excessive. Maybe five, five million dollars, three million dollars. Uh, and that way you avoid the whole um this this whole motion to dismiss for lack of stating amount in controversy being over seventy-five thousand dollars. Now, again, you don't have to prove that amount. You just like I have I have a channel, I have a YouTube channel, and over the course of the last three years, I could have made $7 million on my YouTube channel. Instead, I made four. You owe me the difference. Tortious interference with business practices. Hello? Do, do you follow the, the thread? It's it's very direct. It's a boom, 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 boom. And I'm sorry if you're not following. I know it gets a little complicated, but this is literally as simple as I can make it. There is it, it, I can't make it simpler than that. Uh, thus, it cannot appear to a legal certainty that plaintiff's claims... I keep coughing. I'm trying to mute the mic anytime it comes up. I don't know what is going on with me. I just cannot. I've been literally coughing for like two months almost straight. Thus, it cannot appear to a legal certainty that plaintiffs claimed damages are not made in good faith and two, actually for less than the jurisdictional threshold. The legal certainty standard is high. It is not enough for the court to find that the plaintiff lacked good faith in alleging his damages. And it is not enough for the court to earnestly believe that the plaintiff is extremely unlikely to recover more than the jurisdictional threshold. Rather, the plaintiff's ability to recover the jurisdictional threshold must amount to a legal impossibility, which is not going to be the case here, obviously. This means that an award of damages in excess of 75000 is not legally impossible. This means the amount of controversy is satisfied. This court should not try the issue of damages on a motion to dismiss. Now, because Jeremy meets both the complete diversity and amount in controversy requirements, he satisfactorily invokes the court's diversity jurisdiction under, or I said it's either or, I'm sorry. I'm sorry, I completely, see, you guys are taking me back to law school with this shit. I don't do federal work. No, you need both diversity and amount in controversy over 75,000. You need both diversity and amount in controversy to be 75,000, or it's gotta be a federal question. That's the other one. I was like, it's either or, I knew it was an either or, but it's not an either or diversity or amount in controversy. I'm sorry, I misspoke at the beginning of the video. Um, it has to be both amount in controversy over 75,000 and diversity jurisdiction between two states. Or it's gotta be a federal question, okay? That's the other prong. Federal question would be like um, oil rights. Mineral rights or something like that. Usually, you know, for example, um, there's lots of different federal questions. If it's a constitutional claim, Second Amendment, Fourth Amendment, Sixth Amendment, whatever. Okay.
I want to make sure I don't dox anybody, especially Jeremy. I want to make sure there's his affidavit. I don't believe it has any references to his address. Okay, perfect. Beautiful. That's exactly what I wanted to see. So this one we'll cover as well. This is the first exhibit. It's only seven pages. And then we'll do the other stuff. But I will keep it off screen. So this is going to be on screen. Again, this is document 8.1. So you know it's attached to the same one. Same case number. Same caption. Same everything. This is the affidavit of Jeremy. Jeremy files this affidavit. Before me, the undersigned notary public personally came and appeared. Jeremy Hales, who states, I, Jeremy Hales, being duly sworn, hereby depose and say. So this is under the penalty of perjury. Jeremy says, to my knowledge, all the facts stated in this affidavit are true and correct. I'm over the age of 18. I'm fully competent to make this affidavit, and I have pers personal knowledge of the facts stated. I'm the plaintiff in this lawsuit. This affidavit is submitted in support of the memorandum in opposition to defend this motion to dismiss that, that we just covered. I am one of the fortunate people, he says, who has been able to use the internet to craft a living for myself with over 700,000 subscribers to my YouTube channel, What the Hales. And there's a link. I've always had my domicile in Ohio, and Ohio is where I have my permanent home. I've always lived in Ohio. It is the state where I was born in 1977. I intend to keep an Ohio domicile. My children live in Ohio. In December 2020, I purchased a non-homestead property in Otter Creek, Florida for business purposes. This location has better weather during the winter months than exists in Ohio. And I don't have... And I don't have to shut down a significant part of my business during the winter months, given that I have this Florida location for my business. Thus, since 2021, my YouTube channel has afforded me the ability to split my work time between Otter Creek, Florida and Peninsula, Ohio. On occasion, I use my platforms to benefit charities and to do various giveaways to help deserving people. <laughs> That's an homage to fuck you, John Lynette. I help deserving people, not you fuckers. Uh, part of my internet fame has also led to net attention from people who claim to be fans. Defendants Mr. Cook and Ms. Preston are people who have started off as fans but are now stalking me and my partner. Ms. Preston has had her own YouTube channel since 2020 and seeks donations from the public on an almost constant basis through PayPal, Venmo, and her private Facebook pages. Mr. Cook also has many Facebook pages. Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook claim to run a sanctuary for tortoises. However, in October 2021, they moved and bought property that is directly across the road from the Florida winter location for my business. Initially, I believe Mr. Cook and Ms. Preston were, fan, or Ms. Preston were fans, but they continued to ask for financial help with their nonprofit organization, despite having moved it into a less habitable place for their animals. As I continued to say no to their requests, beginning in February, March 2023, their behavior became more and more tortious, unstable, and dangerous. In April 2023, Mr. Cook posted online a large collection of sex toys and stated that I was selling my items. Mr. Cook also made threats about posting pictures of his penis in my partner's mouth. In May 2023, my attorneys in Florida sent Mr. Cook and Ms. <coughs> Ms. Preston cease and desist letters, a copy of one being attached to my complaint. But this did little or nothing to curb their behavior. In May through June 2023, as outlined in my complaint, Ms. Preston posted signs all over Otter Creek, Florida, calling me an Ohio artist, etc., defaming me and asking for others to run me and my partner back to Ohio. So by her own admission, by her own admission, um, she tried to send him back to Ohio. So she, at one point, what a monkey, what a moron. Send, send Jeremy back to Ohio from whence he came. No, 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 no. No, he lives in Florida now. No, 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 no. Send him back to Ohio. That's where he lives. No, 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 no. He lives in Florida. No, no, no. I mean, you see the audacity. The It's like whatever fits you and your agenda at that moment, that's where you gravitate towards. I mean, come on. That's so stupid. Like, you are worse than the federal government, Lynette. You are worse than the federal government. You're worse than the bureaucracy. You're just like, whatever floats my boat in that moment, that's what you gravitate towards. 
That is so silly. That is so idiotic. And that is so unprofessional and scummy and gross. Okay? That's just the bottom line. Since May 2023 to date, Mr. Cook and Ms. Preston have created and maintained multiple online groups dedicated to hating me. <coughs> and Mr. Cook made sexually explicit posts about my partner and me. In August 2023, Ms. Preston went so far as to email the mayor of Peninsula, Ohio, who knows me very well, to complain specifically about me and my partner and threaten us. Mr. Cook and Ms. Preston's online posts calling me a child predator, oh God, are constant and ongoing to this day. This behavior is escalating, and they are harassing me in Ohio and Florida. As a result, in September 2023, in the Court of Common Pleas in Summit County, Ohio, I filed a civil lawsuit against Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook. And on October 10th, 2023, a final civil stalking protection order was entered in Ohio in my favor and against Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook. See the attached orders from the Court of Common Pleas in Summit County, Ohio. We've gone over these before, by the way, on previous videos, if you've missed them. After a full evidentiary uh, hearing, in a, uh, the Ohio court issued two final orders of protection. <coughs> of protection. The Court of Common Pleas in Summit, Ohio, here and after the Ohio court, and made factual findings that Ms. Preston and or Mr. Cook have knowingly engaged in the pattern of contact that caused me to believe that Ms. Preston and or Mr. Cook will cause me physical harm or cause or have caused me mental distress. See Exhibits 1 and 2. In the two final orders of protection, the Ohio court ordered Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook to not initiate or have any contact with me or my residences, businesses, places of employment, schools, daycare centers, or child provider, child care providers. Contact includes, but is not limited to, landline, cordless, cellular, or digital telephone, text, instant message, fax, email, voicemail, delivery service, social media, blogging, writing, electronic communication, posting a message, or communication by other means directly through another person, directly or through another person. Also, the Ohio court told Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook that they may not violate the order even with my permission, nor shall Ms. Preston and Mr. Cook encourage any person to do any act prohibited by the Ohio court. Now, obtaining these Ohio orders of protection was very important to me and remains so, as I have never intended to remain in Florida indefinitely. There's that, there's that prong, right? Where's the intent to remain indefinitely? That's prong number two. Just because you are currently in Florida does not mean you intend to remain there indefinitely. Both prongs are necessary. That means Jeremy is an Ohio domiciliary. And that is why diversity is met. I have no family in Florida. I do not intend, <coughs> I do not intend to remain in Ohio indefinitely. Ohio is my true, fixed, and permanent home and state of principal business establishment. My primary business LLCs are both incorporated in Ohio. I intend to return to Ohio whenever I am absent therefrom. My Ohio driver's license is the only driver's license I've ever had. My current Ohio home address is on that license. My Ohio property tax bill from Ohio is... My Ohio property tax bill for my Ohio domicile is attached as Exhibit 4. I have never voted in any other state but Ohio. I did want to vote in the local elections of Otter Creek, Florida, as Ms. Preston herself was a candidate for town council, and I believe she would use this position to further cause me physical harm or mental distress. However, Ms. Preston is no longer a candidate, so I have rescinded any such request to vote in the local Otter Creek elections. My, vehicle, my vehicles are and have always been registered in Ohio. I file my federal income taxes in Ohio every year, and my current Ohio utility bills are also attached. Affian saith further not. Such archaic language, but I love it. Jeremy Hills, state uh, uh, of Florida, a notary, and we have the notary right here. So there you have it, folks. The affidavit of Jeremy. Now we're going to go off screen because I do not want to uh, dox Jeremy, but I will continue going over these documents. So the next one. Uh, we have in the Court of Common Pleas in Summit, Ohio. We've gone over this before. That's the final civil protection order. Um, I'm going to write this real quick. Um, in case people are going to be trickling in and wondering. Um, here we go. So... Sensitive information uh, is off screen. So I'm, I'm looking at it, but you're not going to see it because it's not redacted. I didn't have time to redact this. My girlfriend is still asleep, and this happened literally late, late, late last night. Um, 
and I have court this morning, so I'm trying to knock this out of the park as quickly as I can. Uh, so we, we got over the Ohio order of protection. You guys don't need to see this. I'm not even going to go over it. It's like uh, eight pages long. This is the order granting exactly what we went over in that one video. Um, bing, bang, boom. One against uh, John and one against Lynette. Both were uh, order. Uh, both were filed November first, twenty twenty three. Okay, so that's exhibits two and three. Exhibit four is a copy of Jeremy's driver's license. It clearly shows an Ohio address. I can attest to that. Um, and he's got an uh, Ohio Bureau of Motor Vehicles card as well, and it's got an Ohio address on it as well. Next, uh, exhibit five. Exhibit number five is one page. It just shows taxes on the Ohio property in Ohio. Uh, exhibit six is uh, his insurance. Exhibit six is Jeremy's insurance, and that also shows uh, Ohio. Uh, next, uh, exhibit seven is the first page of his federal income tax return with all the numbers, of course, crossed off and redacted, but it also shows the purpose of it is to show a residence in Ohio. And last but not least, uh, a utility bill for February, no, January 2024, due February 7th, 2024, so just last month, showing that he is paying utilities on his address in Ohio. So it's not just a vacant lot. You know, you're paying for electricity, you're paying for all that good stuff. Okay. So let me remove this banner. Um, and last but not least, I want to show you all that I was not bluffing. When you look at the <clears throat> when you look at the um, other motion that was filed, it's also 12 pages with the same exhibits, literally word for word. It, we're not going to go over it. I'm just going to show you guys that I wasn't bluffing. There it is. So this one is John Cook, Memorandum in Opposition to Defendants Cook's Motion to Dismiss. And it's the exact same language. I'm just going to scroll through. I'm going to show you all. It, I literally looked at it. It is word for word. There's not a single difference between these two motions. Where there's no reason to read it all over again. Uh, it's also 12 pages. It is exactly the same word count. I, I checked. There is no difference between against uh, Michelle, uh, 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 I'm sorry, John. So they're both exactly the same, okay? That's it. There you have it, folks. Um, this is this is fun. This is really good stuff. Uh, you know, they tried. They tried. I'll, I'll give them credit, I guess. John and Lynette are trying very hard to dismiss the lawsuit. The only thing they got going for them at the outset is diversity and a mountain controversy, and they argued both. As you can clearly see, I mean, I expected them to fail. You, if you haven't watched the, the last video, that I, I when did I put that one out? Um, that one was March 24th, so just three days ago. Sunday. Sunday, right before the Hales went live. That's right. Sunday. I released it Sunday. Go check it out. Uh, it's only 20 minutes. It's their motions to dismiss. I did them real quick before the hails went live at 8 p.m. And um, I just had some fun with it because I was like, well, first of all, I didn't want to step on their toes while they're live. But at the same time, I realized, hold on a second. Um, this is the dumbest thing I've ever seen. And I, I was I was very dramatic. I was overly dramatic. And it's just fun for me. I mean, th this is the only way to really... You know, people call me all sorts of things. They, they say I'm dramatic. I'm a drama queen. I'm corny. I am, you know, all that stuff. You you have to be in this in this business as a YouTuber. What's the point? Uh, let's today we are going to read John and Lynette's motion to dismiss. I hope you all enjoy this dry reading of dry text and dry paper and dry ink. Here we go. John and Lynette file this motion. To, like, who wants to listen to that? That's boring as piss. That is completely stupid. Why would you want, like, I try to make things entertaining. I try to make things 
as as fun as possible for everybody. Um, if you want this mug, by the way, hashtag buckle up. It's got DUI guy, raw, law, unfiltered on the back. It comes in multiple different colors. You're more than welcome. The link is in the description below. Don't forget to like this video, comment below, subscribe to the channel, hit that notification bell, of course, if you haven't already. Join on as a member if you're so inclined. 99 cents a month. That's like, it's not even a cup of coffee these days. Drip coffee costs more. It's like $1.19. Membership to this channel costs less than drip coffee from, from a gas station. Um, but anyway, <clears throat> um, thank you, Teresa Finn, for becoming a YouTube member. And also thank you, Catherine Baines, for joining on as members. Thank you, Carla Piana, P Piala, excuse me, for the super sticker. And thank you, Grandma Nay. Get a prescription for Teslan's pearls for your cough. They really help. Okay, I'll check that out. Uh, just obey the law and government won't prosecute. Not a banned account. Thank you very much. And uh, morning, Larry. Buckle, hashtag buckle up. I love it. I love it. And uh, Rose Chapman has been a member for one month. Welcome back. Captain Kern just joined literally a few seconds ago. Thank you, Captain. Uh, Captain Kern. And uh, yeah, um, he's like, I thought I was a member. Well, you are now. <laughs> so yeah, um, I don't think... I don't think Jeremy and George are in uh, are going to have trouble with keeping the lawsuit going. Now, of course, the question then becomes, how do you argue your facts and merits and so on and so forth in the future? Um, that's going to be remain to be seen after the judge denies, as I expect them to deny, the motion to dismiss of John and Lynette. I mean, it's one thing to file a motion to dismiss based on lack of diversity jurisdiction, based on lack of a mountain controversy. It's a totally different thing when you are lying to the court about what a case says. You just don't do that. That is one of the biggest no-nos. That is deception to the court. Now the judge has to literally double check your work on everything. Why would you set yourself up for failure unless you're a complete moron? Hashtag shuckle up. So now, now it's evolving. Buckle up is turning into corn. Corn star. This this whole thing has like taken a life a, a life of its own. I love this. I absolutely love the internet. Um, <clears throat> hashtag shuckle up, corn star. This is so great. This is so great. I appreciate all that you do, says Hug Dealer, sending hugs from Massachusetts. Um, thank you, guys. Thank you, guys. I, I love you all. Oh, my God, I'm laughing so hard. Okay, well, um, what else there is to be said? Um, hashtag buckle up. Hashtag it's the law. Thank you for coming to your favorite show on the Internet. Um raw law unfiltered and of course staying for the duration for the time allotted to cover another chapter in the what the hell saga with your favorite host on youtube the dui guy plus and i will see you all either later tonight or tomorrow definitely for our next video i'm going to be talking about how to run successful businesses and also don't forget next friday we're coming down to florida Look out, Judge the Thomases. I am coming for you. Buckle up. It is the law.